Praise the Lord. Good to be in the house of God this morning with God's people as we worship the Lord in praise and as we worship the Lord in word. Thank you for joining us at home. We're so thankful that you uh, chose to have this time to join us on, online. We just ask you, Lord, just, just ask you today, just feel free to worship the Lord with us uh, and just praise his holy name as we celebrate this weekend of Labor Day. I just think we need to raise our hands and thank God for all of our jobs. Amen. Thank God for an employment. And he's just been good to us. And some of us, some people may still need employment. So let's just pray that God would uh, fulfill that need today. Let's just pray. Dear God, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings and your mercy, God, as we set this weekend aside, Lord, in thanksgiving, Lord, for jobs, oh God. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to work, oh Lord, at different plants, different mills, different professions, oh God. We thank you for that, dear God. And those of you, those of them that still may need employment, God, I pray, Lord, supply that need, Lord. Supply that need, I pray, Lord. Lord. You're the God who supplies all of our needs, Lord. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your mercies, oh God, in Jesus' name. I mean, at home and in the sanctuary, I rave to have church. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. How many want people filled with the Holy Ghost today? Baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have church. Worship with our good praise team.
never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Singing your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Girl,
God. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's your breath in our lungs, Lord. Hallelujah. We just cry holy. Holy, holy, holy. We love you. We love you. We love you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love you. We love you. We love you. It is written that one day every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. But I don't want to wait to that day. And you at home, please don't wait to that day. It's going to happen because it's written. I feel a special presence of the Holy Ghost right now. The Lord just wants us to worship him one more time. Dear God, we love you, Lord, today. Appreciate you. This is serious business. God's talking to people right now. One day you will bow your knee. One day you will pray. It will happen. Oh, hallelujah. Might as well do it right now. Might as well do it right now. Oh, hallelujah. 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 From the pastor and assistant pastor and our dear wives and the congregation, Pentecostal of South Lake, thank you for joining us online. Maybe it's your very first time you've ever live streamed us. I want you to know you're at a church that believes in the power of prayer. God's not an insurance company. He reigns on the just and on the unjust. But our hope and our trust is in him. I say our hope and our trust is in him. And I just want you to feel free to pray. We're going to take our, we're going to pray just in a few minutes. Those of you at home, just gather your family. And let's just have, let's have a good season of prayer. How I many just have a need? Just raise your hand right now. You at home, just raise your hand. Also, God knows all about that situation. Let's just pray right now. Dear God, we love you, Lord, today. Appreciate you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy, oh God. All the good things, God, you give us day in and day out, oh God. We love you, Lord, today. God, just ask you, Lord, to mean supply all these needs, God. You know, every hand what it represented, oh God. You know all about that situation, oh God. Move, oh God, like only you can do, God. I pray, God, for every burden, oh God, every heartache, oh God, every situation, oh God, right now in people's lives, oh God, God, I just pray, Lord, you strengthen, you encourage your people, dear God, I pray, Lord, like only you can do, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah, I mean, are thankful to be in the house of God this morning, amen. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Time we're going to bless the, and worship the Lord in our offering. God does supply our needs, and in turn, he just asks for our tithes and our offering. I found this to be true. I've been serving the Lord for almost 50 years as an adult. You give the Lord his 10%, and somehow he makes the other 90% stretch way out over that 100%. How many have found that to be true? It happens time and time and time again. As I teach a new converts class or the young people, you cannot afford not to pay your tithes. I want to say it again. You can't afford not to pay your tithes because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He supplies all of our needs. Praise God. Thankful for the opportunity to give back to the Lord. How many are thankful for that? As we set aside this weekend to uh, honor our jobs and employment, it all comes from God. It all comes from God. So let's just give it back to the Lord and say, God, thank you 
for our jobs. I'm just asked to, uh, right now, we're going to take our offering. This side right here behind Sister Houston first, and this side right here behind the young people can come over on this side. So let's just do that at this time. Amen. You want to sing something? Before the pastor preaches, I just want to send out a big congratulations to our own sister Jessica Husty. She just received her master's degree. <laughs> Amen. And those of you who may be joining us online, there's a place for you at this church. We have tradesmen. I'm a retired bowler maker. We have mill workers. We have health uh, healthcare professionals. We have school teachers. There's a place for you at the Pentecostals of South Lake. Say amen to that. And there's some retired people. We have a good group of young people, a good group of young married. Come out and join us. Praise God. And let's welcome our good pastor, Pastor Straub, as he brings forth the word of the Lord this morning. Amen. Clap your hands for that. Thank you. Let's give glory to God right now. Would you clap your hands? Clap your hands, all you people. Somebody shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Give him praise. Congratulations, Sister Jessica. So nice to have some, some smart people here today. Though you be few, we, the rest of us are glad. It kind of brings up the average, you know. So very proud of you. I know it's taken a lot of work. I want to thank those that have worked so hard on the sound and camera system. Next week, we won't have to be using this phone here. See that nice camera under the screen there? We're going to move the security camera up above the screen, but that's the new camera, and it goes just every which direction, so if a preacher gets to walking or whatever, we can keep up with them. But it's just... Uh, it, it's, it, they worked uh, night and day. I asked Brother Terry Stewart how much sleep he got last night. He said none. I think he's back there sleeping right now. I'm not sure. But uh, we appreciate their hard work. And uh, it's going to be nice. Now, the sound that you're hearing today is not the new system. Nor is it the old system. It's just a makeshift deal to get us through. So if it didn't sound quite right, it's not because uh, it's not going to be good. Because it is going to be good. Somebody said amen. I want to thank you also for the great commitment to Sheaves for Christ last week. There was $8,100 pledged. Thank you so much for that. What a giving church. We appreciate that. And Brother Mark wanted me to be sure to mention that today. Nice to have. Are all three of you girls, Brother and Sister Perry's daughters? 
Well, good. Know, know your grandparents, your parents. Joy to have you here. Their daddy pastors in Bedford. And when I was in youth work, your old dad was just a youth camper at that time. And uh, great people. And we love the Perry family so much. Joy to have you here. And uh, Dylan asked permission to sit with them today. So I've gotten soft in my old age. And there was a time I said, I don't think so. But... Uh, joy to have you here. Everybody said amen. Well, last week was the biggest crowd we've had since COVID started. And this week's perhaps the smallest. <laughs> but uh, we're glad people are able to, to enjoy uh, this holiday weekend with their family and friends. There's no, the reason we're not addressing the overflow room is because nobody's back there. And uh, they couldn't get the sound going back there just here. So we're glad that we're able to have church today, though, right? Everybody said amen. Matthew chapter 11. Jesus said in verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor. Everybody say labor. Kind of fitting for this weekend. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, learn from me, Jesus said, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. So the rest that he's talking about, Brother Terry, I'm sorry to say is not a physical rest here, but it's a spiritual rest. You shall find rest unto your souls. So rest from your labors. Everybody put your Bibles down. Let's lift our hearts and hands one more time. Ask God to help us to declare the word and to receive the word. In Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Like Brother Scott said, we got to make more noise because there's not as many of us here today. Everybody say in Jesus' name. My grandpa, when he'd say raise your hands and give God glory, then he'd say raise both hands, make it look like a big crowd. Let's, let's raise both of our hands today, make it look like a big crowd. Look at that crowd, wow. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Tomorrow's Labor Day and the last uh, holiday of the summer. And Webster's Dictionary has this to say about Labor Day. In the United States and Canada, the first Monday in September, a legal holiday in honor of labor. And so Labor Day is a way of saying thanks in to the working men and women of our great nation. And someday soon, God is going to do the very same thing. He's going to thank us, his people, for our labors that have been done in his will. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor, your labor is not in vain in the Lord, will be rewarded for it. When God created us, he created us to work. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man before he ever sinned and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And so work was not a punishment for having sinned. We were made to work. Before sin ever entered the world, we were made to work. And so work is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And in fact, it's a God thing. We feel better when we work. We feel better, first of all, about ourselves. We feel better physically. We feel better mentally. We feel better emotionally. It gives us a sense of worth because there's a satisfaction a sense of satisfaction that comes 
with a job well done. But we also need to understand today that God is not only concerned with our work. He's also concerned with our getting rest. And somebody say, thank God. For the Lord said in Exodus 29, six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. Six days. But the seventh day is the Sabbath. Everybody say the Sabbath. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it, in the Sabbath, thou shalt not do any work. And so God is concerned not only that we get physical rest. He is concerned for that. But as we'll see a little later, he's also concerned with our getting spiritual rest. And somebody said amen. Amen. And so, as you might expect, that's the, that's the rest that I'd, I'd like to speak to you about here today is that spiritual rest. And so let's start in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus said in verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, the Old Testament law, and the prophets. I am not come to destroy the Old Testament law, but rather I am come to fulfill that law. Verse 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, so till the end of time, till heaven heaven and earth pass, one jot, the Greek word is iota, speaking of a little letter, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled, till it be fulfilled in its entirety. So that's like saying the Old Testament law will be fulfilled to the most minute detail, to the crossing of every T and to the dotting of every I. Nothing will be uh, missed. Everything will be fulfilled. Verse 19, whosoever therefore shall break one, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, verse 20, that except your righteousness shall ex- in the New Testament era shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now the Pharisees supposedly kept the, the letter of the law, but their hearts weren't really right with God. So he said your righteousness has to be more in just Uh, than in just actions, it has to come from the heart. Verse 21, he gave us some examples. You've heard that it was said by them of old time, in the Old Testament era, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, this is how it is now, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, and some translations say that wasn't part of the original, whether it's a cause or not, Whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, which means worthless one, you're worthless, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So you don't have to kill them. You just have to get careless. You just have to despise them in your heart. Verse 27, you've heard that it was said by them of old time, This was an old commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That was one of the ten commandments. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And so it's obvious from these verses and many others in the New Testament to the surprise of many perhaps that the new covenant is actually more strict than the old. For now, Jesus has taken the Old Testament laws of God to a new level of expectation from us out of the realm of actions alone and down deeper into the realm of our thoughts, our intents, our motives. And yet, as I'll explain shortly, the New Testament is still a much better covenant than the old because now, thank the Lord, we have available to us the very spirit of Jesus Christ himself who now indwells those of us who've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Somebody give him some glory right now. Somebody give him some praise. If you have the Holy Ghost, you ought to thank God for it. 
But for now, let's take a look at the Old Covenant beginning with the Ten Commandments. There are thousands of commandments, but let's start with these ten. Exodus 20, verse 1. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. First commandment, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Verse 4, second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that's in earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. Uh, verse 7, commandment 3. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Commandment 4, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Uh, commandment 5, verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Uh, commandment 6, verse 13, thou shalt not kill. Number 7, verse 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. Commandment 8, verse 15, thou shalt not steal. Commandment 9, verse 16, thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Commandment 10, verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Like I said, that's ten of the commandments, and actually there are thousands more throughout the entire Old Testament. In the Gospels, Jesus explained how it is that we are to obey these commandments now in this new covenant era, beginning with verse 35 of Matthew 22. Then one of them, a Pharisee, which was a lawyer, a hypocrite, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments... I know there are thousands, but on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So here Jesus said that these two laws briefly summarize all, the entirety of God's laws. This is the purpose and motivation behind all of God's laws. This is why he gave us these, these laws, that we might love and honor both God and our fellow man. And so these aren't just rules for rule's sake, for all these laws serve a good purpose, as explained by the Apostle Paul in Romans 13 and 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. If I love you, I'm not, certainly not going to kill you. I'm not going to steal from you. I'm not going to lie about you. So the whole purpose of it had to do with love. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commitment, and there are thousands, if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended or summarized in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Because love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Now please note here that Paul said, if there be any other commandment. Well, I can think of at least one that's not mentioned here, and that's the fourth commandment. Exodus 20 and 9. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do not do any work, none, zero. And so what is this fourth commandment really all about? Is it really just about one day of the week that's to be different than all the other days? I mean, we can understand thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, don't lie, don't covet all the other of the Ten Commandments, but how, how 
in this New Testament era are we to keep this commandment? I'm talking about this fourth commandment. This command, is it still important for us now? Are we supposed to keep a day? If we are, we're in big trouble because none of us ever have, at least to the extent taught in the Old Testament. None of us, one day of our lives, have ever kept a day to the extent that the Lord teaches in the Old Testament. So is this command still important in these New Testament times? And of course, the answer is yes. Everybody say yes. For as Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot, one iota, or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till everything be fulfilled. Everybody say fulfilled. So all of these laws have their fulfillment. They've evolved now in this New Testament era. It's no longer just about whether you really actually kill somebody, but now it's beyond that. If you actually despise someone, then you're guilty because you've murdered them in your heart. Or you just look on a woman with lust in your heart. You're guilty of that commandment. So, so how is this fourth commandment fulfilled in this, in this uh, New Testament era? Exodus 31, verse 12. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep. Why? Well, because it's a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. The purpose of this Sabbath is so that you might know that you can't be holy without my help. That's what this Sabbath is. None of your work is going to oppress me. All of your righteousness are as filthy rags. So the purpose of the Sabbath, it's a sign between me and you that you know you can't be holy. You can't live a life that's pleasing to me without my help. In other words, the Sabbath has a spiritual application. It's not just about getting physical rest on one day of the week. Verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. Ooh. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Aren't you glad you don't live in the Old Testament era? We'd all be dead. We'd just all be dead. Let's just face it. So is God really serious about this? Apparently so, for look at these words in Numbers 15. While the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks. Everybody say he gathered sticks on the Sabbath day. I mean, life in prison, right? Death sentence or something. And they found, they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation, they put him in ward. They put him in the little jail they had. The guy next to him said, what are you here for? He said, picking up sticks. The other guy said, because I took the tag off my mattress, you know. They put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said to Moses, the man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the... So that's what I'm saying. None of us have ever kept the Sabbath. If we think it's a day, we're all in trouble. Because none of us have ever kept it, like the Bible says. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp, stoned him with stones. He died as the Lord had commanded Moses. So as we can see here, God obviously really means business about this fourth commandment. It's just as important to him as all of the rest of his commands. Now, you remember that Jesus said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The, the Pharisees were very careful they were very cautious about keeping the Sabbath, so much so, in fact, that they often accused Jesus, the living word of God. They accused Jesus of being a Sabbath breaker. And so how then can our righteousness in this New Testament era exceed that of the Pharisees 
in regards to the Sabbath. And how? How can love, how can love become the fulfillment of this fourth commandment? I mean, I can understand how that love is the fulfillment of some of the other commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. I get that. But how? How does love fulfill this fourth commandment, this one about the Sabbath? It helps to understand that like with the other commandments, then this one also now has been made a condition of the heart. Okay? Helps to understand that this one has evolved also, that it has a fulfillment in the New Testament era. Amen. And uh, so it, it's clear that it's become a condition of the heart rather than just a physical act. And as we'll see in Scripture here shortly, the New Testament Sabbath is clearly a spiritual Sabbath, not a physical one. It's not just Saturday. It's not just Sunday or some other day of the week. For as we'll see in Scripture, it's no longer just a certain day of the week. The book of Colossians was a, was a book written to the church, New Testament saints in the city of Colossae. And the apostle Paul wrote under the inspirations of the Holy Spirit in Colossians 2, 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moons or of the Sabbath days. Now, days is italicized. And uh, that means it wasn't in the original. So, holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath. The Sabbath, which are a shadow. Everybody say a shadow. Which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is Christ. So, according to this God-inspired scripture, the Old Testament Sabbath was a shadow of something that was to come to us in this New Testament era. That means that it was a symbol of something that was to be fulfilled in Christ. There are other instances of, of uh, the word shadow being used in the New Testament. For instance, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, for the law, the Old Testament law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, everybody say sacrifices, which they offer year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. So just as those Old Testament animal sacrifices were just a, a, a shadow, they were just a symbol of things that were to be fulfilled in Christ. We don't offer animals anymore. That's not how, uh, you know, that we fulfill the will of God anymore because now... Christ has become our sacrifice. And so it is also with the Sabbath, as we'll soon see. But some people, and particularly the Jews who converted to Christianity, had a real difficult time laying aside the ceremony of the Old Testament law. They, they had a real difficult time processing this change from the Old Testament law to its New Testament fulfillment. And the Apostle Paul did his very best because he himself had been a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He understood their struggles. So the Apostle Paul did his best to help them through this transition, saying in Galatians 4 and verse 9. But now, he was writing to Jewish Christians, now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you Jewish Christians once again to the weak and beggarly elements, making reference to the law, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. And then he got specific, verse 10. You observe days. You think it's a day that God's interested. He's interested in your heart. You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you. Paul said, I'm concerned about you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. And so what then? church is the New Testament Sabbath and how are we to keep the Sabbath now in this New Testament era Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1 let us therefore fear be concerned lest a promise everybody say a promise being left us we got a promise from the Old Testament being left us of entering into his rest any of you should come short of it. 
For we which have believed, verse 3, do enter into rest. So here, the writer of Hebrews, and the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews was, uh, of course, a New Testament book, and chiefly it was all about trying to convince the, the Jews that had converted to Christianity that, you don't, the Hebrews, that's, that's Jews, that they didn't need to keep the ceremony of the Old Testament law any further. So here the writer of Hebrews said that there was a promise given to us in the Old Testament era that was left unfulfilled at that time. Hebrews 11 makes reference to that. Hebrews 11, of course, is the, is the great heroes of faith chapter, Old Testament uh, heroes of faith, one after another, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of Moses, David, all of them, Joseph, and so on and so forth. But then verse 39 concludes the chapter with these words, these all, all of these Old Testament heroes of faith, having obtained a good report through faith, received not, however, the promise, God having provided some better thing for us here in this New Testament era, something better than just a certain day of the week, as we'll see. Now, several of the Old Testament prophets had spoken of this coming promise, including Jeremiah in the 31st chapter of his prophecy, verse 31. Behold, the days come, looking forward to this New Testament era, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant, a new testament with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant, the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, the rest of the laws, not according to the covenant that I made with their father in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was an husband to them, saith the Lord. So as Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, this new covenant would not uh, be done away with. It would not do away, rather, with the old, but rather it was going to fulfill it. He's not saying that we're, we're scrapping the old covenant. That's not what he's saying here. He's just saying there's something better coming. Amen. We're not going to do away with it. It's going to rather be fulfilled. And verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law. Now at Sinai, where did he put his law? He put it on tables of stone. But he said, not going to do that in the new covenant, but rather I'm going to put my law, including the fourth commandment in their inward parts rather than on tables of stone. And I'm going to take these laws and I'm going to write them in their hearts and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. Ezekiel also prophesied of it, saying in the 36th chapter of his prophecy, verse 26, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit. How many have received that spirit? They didn't have that in the Old Testament. That's the promise that they hadn't received. A new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh, a tender heart toward God. I will put my spirit, the Lord said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you or enable you to walk in my statutes, including the fourth commandment. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. Paul wrote about the fulfillment of this in the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians, telling the church at Corinth, for as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle or letter of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone as at Sinai, but rather in fleshly tables of the heart. So in this New Testament era, we have the promise of the baptism of the Holy Ghost who comes to us as the living word of God and writes God's laws on our hearts rather than on tables of stone, thus enabling us by his indwelling spirit to live lives that are pleasing to God. If you got the Holy Ghost, you ought to thank God for that. None of us can serve God in our own strength. None of us can live lives that are pleasing to God in our own strength. Somebody give God some praise right now. So Jesus spoke of this coming promise before he ascended to heaven in Luke 24, 49. Behold, I send the promise, the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye 
in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Acts chapter 1, same setting. Being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Then he told them plainly what the promise was. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Several days later, just like Jesus said, it happened. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you have that experience, you ought to thank God for it right now. Later that day, as a crowd gathered, Jesus, uh, Peter preached to them. And at the conclusion of his message, when they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise, the promise that the Old Testament saints didn't have that we can now have, in the New Testament, it's clearly, it's clearly the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Somebody ought to thank him for it right now. And so the New Testament Sabbath is a spiritual experience. An experience that's designed to give us spiritual rest. He's even more concerned about our spiritual rest than he is about our physical rest. Hebrews 4 and 9. I'm not just saying this stuff, but we have scripture for it. Hebrews 4 and 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Verse 10. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Our feeble efforts to try to please God in our own strength, we've ceased from that. And now we, with God's help, live a life that's pleasing to him. So I hope that we all understand our desperate need of this rest of which I speak this morning. For the weakness of the Old Testament law was in that it offered no help whatsoever to people in their efforts to overcome the sinful tendencies of the flesh. And Paul spoke of these tendencies in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Paul said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. To will is present with me. I want to do right, but how to perform that which is good I find not. That was a struggle in the Old Testament. It was written on tables of stone. They knew what God wanted them to do. They just didn't have the strength to do it. The good that I would, he said in verse nine, uh, 19, the, the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil, which I say I'm not going to do that, no more than turn around, there I am doing it. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Can I find help anywhere? And then he got the inspiration in verse 25, said, I thank God. Here's the answer. Here's where I can get help. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus can deliver you from it. Somebody clap your hands to him right now. And then the very next verse in Romans 8, 1 continues. The very next verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, in the Old Testament era, they didn't have that option, but now we do. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I don't have to live a life of sin anymore. For what the law, what the Old Testament law written on tables of stone could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. It just told me what God wanted me to do. It didn't tell me how to do it. For what the law, the Old Testament law, could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. And now I have his spirit inside of me, so I can, I can also condemn sin in the flesh. Verse 4, so that the righteousness of the law, because he didn't come to do away with it, he came to fulfill it. So that the righteousness of the law, the Old Testament law, the purpose of the Old Testament law might be fulfilled. There's that word. Didn't come to do away with it. I came to give you the strength to fulfill it. That it might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If we've got the Holy Ghost, let's walk in the Holy Ghost. Somebody? And so this is the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself enabling us by his indwelling Holy Spirit to fulfill the righteous requirements of the Old Testament law. To not steal, to not lie, to not kill. How many stopped doing things you used to do when God filled you with the Holy Ghost? Come on, somebody. Somebody ought to thank him for it right now. Don't have to do those things anymore because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that he has given us in this New Testament era. So as I said earlier, the New Testament Sabbath is an experience with God that brings with it a spiritual rest where we no longer have to try in our own strength to be good enough, where we no longer have to endeavor to save ourselves by our own works, our own feeble efforts to keep some rules. For now, we have the very spirit of Jesus Christ himself living on the inside of us. And if we'll stay full of the Holy Ghost, come on somebody, if we'll stay full of his spirit, it will be then his works, his labor that's flowing through us rather than our own feeble efforts. None of us can walk with God without his help. Somebody lift your hands to him right now. I need your help. You know, you know that I can't do this without you. You saw me, Lord, without you. You saw my feeble efforts. But now I have, thank the Lord, the very spirit of Christ himself living inside of me and if we'll stay full of the Holy Ghost it will be his works that are now flowing through us Ephesians 2 8 for by grace the Greek word translated grace is charis which means the divine influence doesn't mean just undeserved favor unmerited favor it means the divine influence for by grace his influence are you saved through faith not of yourselves you fail every time. It is the gift of God, not of works. Speaking of our own feeble efforts, fleshly efforts, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now it's his good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Philippians 2.13 in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, the saints at Philippi, he said, for it is God which worketh in you. No longer have to try to do this in your own strength because now when you have the Holy Ghost, it is God which works in you both to will, anybody here want to serve God? That's a gift from God. Both to will, it's God working in you that gives you that will. For it's God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In the Old Testament, he had the will, but they didn't have 
the power to do. But now through the power of the Holy Spirit, come on somebody, we not only have the power to will, but we actually have the power to do as well. Somebody give God some praise right now. In this New Testament era, we, don't have to get, we do not have to get good to get God. Some people, some of you, some of you people, sweet people waiting around to get good, to get God. Well, you've been waiting a long time. We all tried that. never worked for any of us. won't work for you either. We don't get good to get God. We get God to get good. Come on, lift your hands to him. Somebody lift your hands. To, ah! Can't be good on my, no, I can't please God in my own strength. I need to get God to get good. Here's a promise in Philippians 1. Paul said, I'm confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun, started a good work in you, he'll perform it. Come unto me, all ye that labor, heavy laden, you're trying to please God in your own strength. I'll give you rest. If you let him, I'm confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. If you let him until the day of Jesus Christ. So if we'll allow him, he'll do the work of living right. I can't do it. I can't live right in my own strength. I fail time and again. But if I'll allow him, he'll do the work and enable me to live right through his Holy Spirit that indwells me. Somebody praise. I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody praise him right now. Somebody thank him for the Holy Ghost right now. And so as you can see, the New Testament Sabbath is not just a single day of the week when we rest from our physical labors. It was a shadow. It was an object lesson to lead us to Christ. The New Testament Sabbath is a spiritual experience that allows us to rest from our own personal efforts to save ourselves by our own strength. Titus 3 and 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done in our efforts to please him, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Verse 5 was talking about my feeble works. Verse 8 is talking about his good works if I'll allow him to work through me. Come on, somebody. So there's two types of works mentioned here in Titus, those that are motivated by our flesh and those that come as a result of having had our spirits renewed by his Holy Spirit. But we do need to understand this. Even though the New Testament Sabbath is a spiritual experience, God still honors a certain day. Now you think I'm tearing down everything that I've spent the last 45 minutes saying. He still requires us to keep a certain day. I'll show you what I mean. Hebrews 4 and 4. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached, the Jews, entered not in because of unbelief. Verse 7, he, again, he limits, like he did in the Old Testament, he limits a certain day, saying in David prophetically, today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus, now Jesus and Joshua mean the same thing. He's talking about Old Testament Joshua here. Had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. 
there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. So he said in verse 7, today, he limits a certain today. What is that day? It's today, today, if you will hear his voice. And so the New Testament Sabbath is not just a one-time experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but rather it's a daily experience as well as a daily walk in the Holy Ghost. For the scriptures tell us that we need to remember the Sabbath day to keep it, to keep it holy. Okay, I want to keep the Sabbath day. I want to keep it holy. But what day is the Sabbath day? Is it Saturday, as some say, or is it Sunday, as others say, but the writer of Hebrews told us that it's today. No matter what day of the week it is, it's always today. Today is the day that I must keep. Today is the day, are you hearing me, somebody, that I must choose to rest from my own feeble works and from my own personal efforts to somehow live a life that would be pleasing to God. Today is the day that I must surrender to his Holy Spirit that indwells me. For, as it says in 2 Corinthians, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man must be renewed, how often? Day by day. Today is the day we need to set aside unto the Lord. Somebody give him praise with me right now. I don't care if it's Monday. I don't care if it's Thursday. I don't care if it's Saturday. Whatever day it is, we got to live for the Lord, and we've got to be full of his Holy Spirit. And somebody said amen. So Paul said in one of his epistles, one person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day the same. But what we all must esteem, esteem to be of equal importance every day is our personal relationship with God. Whether it be Saturday or Tuesday or Thursday or Sunday, Isaiah 58, toward the end of that fasting chapter, the Lord said, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, in other words, if you'll choose to go, where he wants you to go rather than where you want to go. From doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. Somebody praise him right now for that promise. He doesn't just want us to seek his will on Saturday or on Sunday. He wants us to seek his will and to walk in it every day. Somebody praise him with me. So again, I say the New Testament Sabbath is not just our initial experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but rather it's a daily experience in the Holy Ghost. As Paul said, our inward man must be renewed day by day. Why? So I can keep the Sabbath. He's still serious about the fourth commandment so that I can keep the Sabbath, the fulfillment of the Sabbath. Because last week's Holy Ghost experience is like last week's leftover meatloaf. It was good, hopefully, it's according to who made it. Not everybody makes meatloaf the same, let me tell you. But it was good meatloaf. You got it at Cracker Barrel or your mom or your grandma or your sweet wife made it. Be leery of anybody else's meatloaf. Where was I in this? But I'm trying to say we need to keep our experience fresh. You see, because spiritual strength like physical energy we use it we spend it it has to be renewed I slept last night I'm planning on sleeping again tonight 
I got rest yesterday. I, I need rest again today. Are you understanding? I got spiritual rest yesterday, but I need to get some spiritual rest again today. I can't do it in my own strength. Got to be renewed in his spirit today. I need a fresh experience with the Lord today. Somebody give him some glory with me right now. So if you're living on last week's experience, it was good when it was fresh. It was nourishing. It was strengthening then. But now, but now its usefulness is gone. And if I've not been renewed in the Holy Ghost since then, bad news, I'm no longer keeping the Sabbath. And he's serious about all his commandments, including his fourth commandment. No longer keeping the Sabbath, and I've reverted back I've reverted back. If I'm not praying, oh, I might know all the rules, and, but if I'm not praying, I'm just fooling myself. And, and uh, I'm reverted back to my own fleshly efforts, my own feeble works of trying to please God in my own strength. I'm a Sabbath breaker. Galatians 3.1, Paul addressing again the, the Jews who were having a hard time making the transition. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law? Did you, did you receive the Holy Ghost because you don't do any work on Saturday? Or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now today... Made perfect by the flesh? Church, none of us can do this in our own strength. And when we attempt to, hear me, we become New Testament Sabbath breakers. And our labor then is in vain. For as the psalmist said, except the Lord builds the house, they labor it's just fleshly efforts. They labor in vain that build it. Somebody praise him with me. I'm almost done. But it doesn't have to be that way now in this New Testament era. For now, we can choose to rest from our works, from our own feeble efforts to please God by staying full every day, making it priority to stay full of the Holy Ghost. For now, it's as Paul said in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ. Not in my own strength. But I can do all things if I get full of the Holy Ghost. I can make it. I don't know what today holds. But if I'll stay full of the Holy Ghost, I can face it, whatever it is. I can do all things through Christ, who is my strength. Christ, who strengthens me. Today, on this Sabbath day, my spiritual strength does not lie in my own ability to do what's right. Tomorrow, on the Sabbath day, my spiritual strength will not lie in my own ability to do what's right. This coming Thursday, on Sabbath day, my spiritual strength will not lie in my own ability to do what's right. Come on, church. I need to stay full of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I need a fresh experience with God every single day. Somebody said amen. Because I'm not able to live a life that's pleasing to God in my own strength, and neither are you. That's our only hope of being saved, is to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, not doing whatever you want to do, as it said in Isaiah, but doing his pleasure by his spirit, letting him work in and through us every single day. It's our personal responsibility to keep our Holy Ghost experience current and fresh and up to date. For Isaiah prophesied of this coming New Testament experience, saying in the 28th chapter of his prophecy, for with stammering lips and another tongue, Will he speak to this people? That's, that's mentioned in Corinthians. He's talking about the Holy Ghost because Paul made reference to this in Corinthians. For with stammering lips 
and another tongue will he speak to this people. He's talking about talking in tongues there. To whom he said, look at this, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said this. It's in scripture time and time again. This is the rest wherewith you shall cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. It's both the initial rest and it's the sign of being renewed or refreshed in the Holy Ghost. It's both. And somebody said amen. For as Paul wrote, this inward man needs to be renewed day by day. Old brother G.A. Mangan, bless his heart, said if you don't talk in tongues every day, you ought to try anyway. Come on, somebody, it's true. You ought to go after it. You ought to want it. You ought to be hungry for it. It's our only hope. Without it, we're Sabbath breakers. I said without it, we're Sabbath breakers. If we're just walking in our keeping a set of rules that we learned many years ago. Hey, we're just Sabbath breakers. we got to stay full of the Holy Ghost. Clap your hands to the Lord, somebody. So I close now with this invitation from Jesus himself. Would you stand? Close your eyes. Just Would you lift your hands? In hunger, aren't you glad to be living in this era? I'm so glad to be. Jesus is saying to us, come unto me, all ye that labor. You're trying to get good to get God. And you keep getting frustrated because you can't do it. And you throw up your hands and you want to give up. But Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn from me. Take my yoke. Let me live it through you. A couple oxen yoked together. The Lord said, I'll be the lead. They, they, they all, sometimes we put a young ox next to an to a experienced ox so that the experienced ox would show him. The, he said, take my yoke upon you. Walk with me. Let me lead you. Follow my, let me guide you through my, my Holy Spirit. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest. You'll find rest for your souls. He's talking about the New Testament Sabbath being a spiritual rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy. My burden's light. So it's only hard to walk with God when we try to do it in our own strength. That's when it gets hard. But if we'll stay full of the Holy Ghost, it's a joy. It's a delight. Somebody lift your hands and surrender to the Lord right now. Come unto me. Somebody literally do that right now. Come unto me. All ye that labor. You just try and you fail. And you just try and you fail. And you get so frustrated. I know I've been there. We've all been there. but just stay full of the Holy Ghost. You've been so good. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend, but I want us to find a place to pray. Let's make this whole sanctuary a place of prayer right now. Let's kneel where we are. Take this home with you. So many people struggle with what's the Sabbath? How do you keep the Sabbath? I hope this lesson has helped you today. Let's find a place to pray. Let's not be Sabbath breakers, but every day, let's live and walk in the Holy Ghost. Somebody said amen. Let's find a place to pray as they sing.
needs to be a priority. I can't walk with God without the Holy Ghost. I gotta stay full of the Holy Ghost. Because in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Nothing. feeble efforts to please you in my own strength, Lord. How stupid is that? I find everything I need. Bow at your feet, Lord. 